Uh, hi, I am, uh, <clears throat> maybe, I don't know if you remember, I'm the uh, representative for the Interplanar Consortium of Post-Mortal Beings. I contacted you about our, uh, our needs for antiquity storage, and you said you'd have some options? Oh, yes, and once again, thank you for choosing Dungeon Realty. Uh, yes, I do. I was just uh, compiling that list. I have, for you, a pocket dimension. All the furniture are mimics, so you don't I even have to worry about... No. no, no, no mimics. And besides, we've got bags of holding. Uh, don't really work well with the pocket dimension. That's all. You anything have, else? I understand. That's all you have to say. I have on the west side near the volcanoes a six-room dungeon that mm -mm -mm -mm. is at I least. I gotta have at least five, five, five room. Come on, five room. Come on. Okay. What are do five, with the six yeah, room? five room dungeons are are the craze. It's six room. It's like a it's it's like a six the wheel. Um, okay. No, no. Hang on. We can still work with this. Nope. Oh. Okay. Okay. Down by the harbor. Five room mm -hmm. dungeon, bespoke traps preloaded, yeah, and there is room for on site security. Ooh, I love that. What about waste removal? Uh, yeah, there is a gelatinous cube there. Just please don't tease it. Sounds perfect. Awesome. Well then, why don't we uh, go ahead and sign the papers on this uh, adventure location here on WebDM? Okay, Jim, it's uh, it's a little bit more than just a, a realtor catchphrase, uh, but adventure locations. It's it's a it's a it's 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 a skill of, of paramount importance for for a DM to be able to run one of these. It took me a long yeah. time before yeah. I could really grasp like really what this is supposed to be for mm -hmm. an encounter but let, let's uh let's let's walk through the uh what's what's the intro to this what's the intro to uh running an adventure location in your mind yeah yeah so to me like a location-based scenario whether it's a dungeon crawl or like a heist in a bank vault or something or it's like exploring a derelict spaceship like to me they are as important and foundational to uh you know to role-playing games it, as i can think of right like it's npcs and locations you know and mm -hmm. being able to accurately like not just describe one of these places but make it come to life and have it interface interact with the rule system and what the players want to do well really brings these locations to life um, and so in that sense, uh, this is a continuation of our, uh, you know, DM basics, uh, series. So it builds on the information that we talked about, um, in descriptions, different topics related to describing things, uh, and, and creating an evocative picture, but it also kind of pairs well with, uh, our NPC and city shows from last year. Uh, and mm -hmm. you'll find a lot of parallels uh, with that, as well as some ex specific examples uh, that we talked about in the city show. We'll kind of mention them here again. Uh, you can see them in a more, I don't know, generic form in this show. Um, so yeah, b being able to build and run a location is really a foundational DM skill. And what you'll find is that it's useful in nearly any genre or situation. Like it's not a one size fits all game structure. It's not the only thing that you need, but I found like everything from like a, a dungeon assault, we're going to kick in the door and just clear out this place of monsters to we're hosting a party and there's a specific, you know, group of people here that we're looking to keep tabs on or get information from under the cover of this larger social gathering that having an idea of, of the, space that this takes place in is really important for running it because it's going to give you the confidence you need to like roll with the punches that the PCs throw at you and whatever crazy ideas that they try out, <laughs> you'll be able to say, mm -hmm. yeah, let's go over there. Let's check this place out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I guess first and foremost, uh, kind of diving into the, uh, the nitty gritty of it here. Uh, you're going to need to know uh, a reason that you need a location, right? You need a, yeah. You need a purpose for that location. So what, what's your thought process uh, when it comes to this, this first integral step? Yeah, yeah. And I think this really important for running uh, a location is being able to build it yourself or at the very least dissect it and put it back together if you're, uh, say, running a, something from a module or a pre-published adventure. But if you're creating it yourself... 
um, you know, the first thing that that I think of is what kind of scenario am I running here? What do I need this place for? Because a, a stealth infiltration type scenario versus frontal assault versus some kind of enemy ambush, those are all different from each other. And then those are completely different from what you might need the, uh, the information for, for a social scenario or an exploration type scenario, right? And so understanding what it is you're trying to set up and, and the kind of game you're trying to deliver is really gonna help you with this. Because, you know, if you're running like a stealth infiltration type scenario, then knowing where, say, the guards are, what their, you know, patrol patterns are, maybe even like their arc of vision that they can, uh, <laughs> you know, that they can see things uh, in is something that's important. And, and, you know, you want that information both on your map and your key, you want it readily available. But for a frontal assault where stealth might not necessarily be that much of a concern, you don't need that kind of information, or you don't need as, as a fine grain of detail for that information. Um, and so that's really the, the number one thing that I think of, mm -hmm. because it determines everything else, whether the map is really concrete and shows like exact distances and, and room contents as well, or if it's more, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, relational and abstract, you know? Oh, most definitely. And uh, I, if you if you like us uh, here at WebDM getting into our own fine grain detail, you can come on over to our Patreon where you're going to get a podcast every week uh, at the five dollar level, and we we go in depth. Uh, it's a lot of lot of lot more deep uh, than we're gonna than we get here. But uh, anyway, second uh, then. As far as uh, yeah. the purpose of your location is, is it needs to be evocative, right? It needs to yeah. needs to like stand out from the doldrum of adventuring. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be um, memorable for its own sake, right? Es especially if it's something in your game world that's like notable, like say a tavern or a castle or a monument or or like a specific feature of the landscape, something that isn't. Um, you know, just a, a backdrop for an evocative NPC, but a place that's a character in its own right. You know, so in this sense, what is it that you can build into your descriptions of the location or into the underlying game mechanics that will really highlight this place as a character in and of itself? So a classic mm -hmm. example of this, um, you know, might be some kind of uh, hazardous wilderness or something. And, and, you know, let's call it a, you know, a fey wild type wood, you know, primal savagery and, and sort of fairy whimsy. And working those mm -hmm. things in either through like co-opting spell effects and having those be a part of the hazardous nature of the environment or like it colors every encounter that you have there, like every enemy that you run across has something related to one of these themes that's expressed mechanically. That is a way that you can portray a location as a character in and of itself, right? Like a classic example oh, yeah. I can really think of from D&D is Strahd's Castle. You know, to me, oh, yeah. when you look at the Curse of Strahd, <laughs> it's this massive, multi-spired uh, vampire's castle, and and it's it's evocative. It's it, it has secrets and and other things going on other than Strahd, right? There's all mm -hmm. kinds of NPCs and comings and goings and little places. That, it has its own story to tell, as it were. Yeah, uh, that's what makes a location a character in and of itself. Oh, definitely. Uh, and yeah, as playing Strahd, thinking about that ever-present looming structure, no matter where you go yeah. in this valley, you can always see it, uh, you know, and what that does, if you can have a location like that that, the, that, that your players can see but can't get mm -hmm. to yet, so it lets them start creating fictions in their mind. Yeah. And yeah. that is, is better than any story you can tell. The horrors oh, yeah. and mysteries that they're creating, like that's why you just give a, a just enough a nugget of description <laughs> to uh, to kind of spark that uh, in and of itself. But uh, yeah. uh, like you said, Strahd's Castle is is a, is a character in of itself. But there are also care uh, structures or places that are pretty uh, dependent on say oh, another yeah. character an npc a villain you know whether it's the thief thieves guild uh, master's lair that you have to yeah. go you know do a deal with them or something like that uh like 
like having a, a location that is all centered around, uh, or obviously the Wizard's Tower. Um, oh yeah, is another yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, it, it, elaborate on that. I was going to say, yeah, a location that's sort of an extension of another character. And the, I love the examples you're using: Wizard's Tower, Thieves Guild. Um, you know, they might be notable locations they might be you know prominent locations but really they exist to highlight their inhabitants right they're not yeah. trying to highlight something independent of that they're like this is the wizard's tower everything in it is going to say something about this wizard in particular who they are what they're into you know the state of their uh, you know, their schemes whenever, uh, you know, the, the party finally gets to them. Is it abandoned? Is it not? Uh, who's there as a visitor? Who's there as a prisoner? All of those things are information about that wizard that the players can use. Same with something like a dragon slayer. Uh, you know, a dragon slayer is very much an extension of the dragon, you know, lakes of, of, of molten rock and, and, you know, or, or twisting poisonous green vines of a green dragon or something like that you know those say something about the monster that is there like when you're thinking of these locations it doesn't have to be just the location there's mm. everything that leads up to that like w whether it's the the area around it but or, like clues that kind of lead you to say a dragon's lair you're going to find carcasses of of eaten things or sure. or just yeah. like very scared wildlife all the time, you know, something right. like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's uh, a, a lot of the thematic detail uh, that you're talking about here can, you know, obviously reinforce any of these things, but it also gives the players the little nuggets and seeds that they need to to really imagine the hell out of this place. So the kind of details that you, um, you know, that you specify about a location really go into reinforcing that. You know, let's talk about something more modern here. Let's talk about like an office building that you might be using as a location. You could go like the Die Hard route, and this is an office building where where there's a hostage scenario or someone, you know, the bad guys have taken it over or something. Is it a lighthearted, you know, quick beer and pretzel style game that you're running? Then maybe the details are a little less gruesome, a little less dark, uh, and more about like a, portraying the frantic uh, and frenetic moment that you're in, papers scattered everywhere, people screaming and huddled in office rooms and the like. Or is it going to be gruesome? Is this like a Lovecraftian horror that is that is somehow shown up in this very mundane and, and ordinary place? Then, like, how do we know that? What what kind of feeling does this place have? What what um, what details can you draw upon mm -hmm. to really hammer this home? Um, and this is why we're saying yeah. it builds on the description episode because the place comes to life, and the scenario type that you're trying to uh, you know, to run through comes to life through your description. An infiltration type uh, scenario is reinforced by descriptions of shadows, of places to hide, uh, of of the the level of noise that that uh, a place has, or its level of activity. Right? Those convey information that is immediately relevant to the players, and and gives them something that they can uh, work with when deciding what to do next. Yeah, you you said Die Hard and 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 Cthulhu, and now I can only think of the villain Hans Group Thulu. And, uh, <laughs> right, it's got to get in that vault where the Necronomicon is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> got to get into that. I vault. love it. I got I got to do that now. Ladies and gentlemen, give me your sanity. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so y y as a DM going through this this thought process um mm -hmm. you've got your scenario you know the location you know what it's supposed to be there like now it's time to you know you you gotta you gotta put it down on paper so to speak right like so yeah. you need a good you need a, you need a map like you need a map just have something come on right i do think it's important <laughs> to have a map <laughs> yeah even just a doodle uh, on a napkin yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a map that you're going to post online or you're going to show people. It's, it's there for you as the dungeon master to help organize the information that you have. Yeah. And because positioning in, in space and even time is important for these kinds of scenarios, then having some way to quickly reference that 
is going to be important. Yeah. So let's take a minute to break from the, uh, you know, from the dungeon sort of action oriented style of locations and go more towards the party style, right? In a party, there's always a place or two where nobody expects, nobody expects it to be the hot spot, but it just kind of becomes one. Right. Uh, if this is somebody's house party, maybe it's outside somewhere, the kitchen for some weird reason or something. Right. Um, yeah. So being able to sort of like know where those zones are, who's in what zone when. Right. Like if you're there, you know, if your uh, character is there because they're trying to like win the affection of someone that's there at the party, an NPC or something. Where are they? Where Where is this NPC? How long are they going to be in the place that they're at? Is there anyone uh, that's, that's going to interpose themselves between PC and NPC to like delay them or stall them or help them, right? Being able to keep track of all this information it, it can be very important because the timing of things might be important, right? This mm -hmm. is a style of scenario that, that really does ground itself in a kind of... I really hate to use the word, but a more simulationist style approach to the game, as opposed to one that's relying on, uh, you know, dramatic beats uh, or something that that lets you introduce the love interest, something like that, right? Um, and so, being able to like tell where these uh, locations are, tell where the PCs are within these locations, as well as whatever else is there that they might interact with, is going to be important. But it does not mean that you're about to, you know, enter your map into some kind of cartography contest or it needs to be perfect. It just needs to be enough for you to understand, you know, yeah. circles and lines is just as good as mapping the whole thing out down to the flagstone. <laughs> oh, most definitely, because I, I know as a player um, and we've spoken about this before, but like as a player, whenever you're getting description and you're trying to formulate your plan of attack, how you're going to move through this space, and then all of a sudden you get a detail that just doesn't, you know, like, I turn left, but that's a blank, that's a wall, yeah. according to my yeah. map. Like, it, it's happened before, and whether it's a miscommunication or just like, oh, you know, your map gets flipped around or whatever, but that consistency and continuity is important because that can some that can really bog down play, and it can really kind of mm -hmm. sometimes it can sap the mo sap the the tension that you've been building if you're like kind of doing an exploration uh, scene through some you yeah. know, dark dingy tunnels or whatever, and then all of a sudden like, well, hang on, now let's break the maps out and just totally pull everybody out of the scene and yeah. go through this mapping pro pro problem as you know mm -hmm. you get the uh, calculating because <laughs> everybody's circle on the same the page. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Just to get everybody uh, working together. Yeah. Being able to like have a type of, you know, being able to have a spatial consistency, right? Being able to say, mm -hmm. this is where this thing is, this person is. And when you come back to it after some time away, it's where you left it. Um, right. To me, it's important for that suspension of disbelief, that immersion that a lot of people really like out of role playing games. But it's also important for the game aspect of it because players are making decisions based on this. You know, in our party scenario, um, you know, the love interest might be about to leave, and the player might have said, Well, I make sure that I'm near the exit in case this kind of thing happens. But mm -hmm. the for whatever reason, in the in the course of running it, it, wires got crossed and where the player decided to post up and where the dungeon master knows where the exit is get crossed. And now there's some retconning. Oh, wait, I if I was there, I would have done X, you know, things like that mm -hmm. can be reduced uh, by consistency and, and a sense of like continuity as you're exploring uh, these places. And I think that makes for a richer game. It makes for a world that comes to life and it doesn't have to be a ton of bookkeeping on the play uh, mm -hmm. or the, sorry, on the part of the, the dungeon master. Um, mostly because a lot of this information can go directly on your map, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it, 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 sometimes in these scenarios also uh, having something for the players to see is still a good thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like at least having like a layout, uh, like give them something like <laughs> just give them something. Yeah. <laughs> I love, uh, I love handouts. Right. Yeah. I, I love to be able to hand the players a picture of something and say, this is what it is. Right. Like D and D modules that have a, a visual aid, uh, you know, supplement of some kind can be really handy that way because 
it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Pictures worth a thousand words kind of stuff, right? Um, I mean, always. I, Right. <laughs> Even if it's just like, you know, you want to go with something evocative and, and interesting, something that's really going to grab the player's attention, or if it's like the handout is part of the puzzle of this place, right? Like looking at this handout and treating it, I don't know, like a highlights magazine game or something. I don't even know they still have highlights uh, <laughs> is is a valid way of playing, right? Like you're testing player skill by going, what seems off about this picture? Because this is what your character sees right this is the thing your character's looking at and in that sense like the internet is a wealth of options for you for finding pictures of rooms locations things inside rooms um, you know any sort of image that you want is probably a, you know a google search away from uh from being in your player's hands i think it's handy to have a you know a store of those pictures somewhere so that you can hand them out um mm -hmm. but you can also use like generic uh you know apartment floor plans or generic office building floor plans or just something mm -hmm. right like a, a stock uh, folder of generic locations with very simple visual elements that you uh you know that you hand to the pcs or let them see or something um can also make life easier on you uh, as dungeon master Oh, most definitely. Uh, I, I used the my last hospital I worked at for one of my home games for the dungeon. Because <laughs> uh, having a hospital layout with the crazy amount of staircases and elevators and different rooms, uh -huh. uh, it worked. It worked very well. I've used a mall layout for a for a port of call, a small yeah. like harbor area. That's mm -hmm. I, uh, let me tell you, mall layouts are are pretty great for you want to you want a, a, a close knit small town, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just pick a mall layout uh, and just pick, pick one of the floors. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a couple of roads, some intersections, the food court. <laughs> There's your market. There you go. <laughs> um, but, uh, but whenever you are making all of these, you know, layouts, uh, maps, and things like that, like mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is for the for the DM to know what they're looking at and to have 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 a key. Right. Like yeah. if you I I have done this before where I've made a map and then they're like, hey, what's this? And I look at it and I realize I didn't assign anything for that. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> shit. <laughs> like, uh, and then you, then you yeah. have to roll that mental uh, random encounter in your head. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I there's a uh, significant overlap between your map any visual cues that you give to the players the layout that you use for a place and like your key the dungeon master's key and as much as possible i like to put information on the map itself right uh, you know a classic dungeon has a bunch of square rooms with with lines connecting them and a bunch of numbers or letters in the rooms maybe some symbols or something like that on them um, and it's very featureless it, you know, yeah. it's, it's just the, you know, the minimum you would need for running one of these things. And one of the things that I do when I'm running, say, a pre-published module is to take the information that's in there along with the map and then just make my own, <laughs> right? Like, I'm going to take this map, mm -hmm. redraw it on a piece of paper, put everything on there that I want, whether it's the contents of the room, if there's traps or treasure or monsters, um, you know, different lighting effects or different magical effects where they are uh, in this place, um, patrol routes for guards, uh, it, you know, anything like that. I'm going to start putting it on the map itself because I'm going to use that in play. Like I'm going to probably have like a pencil or something and be tracing or tracking the various characters movement through that space as as they choose to explore different directions, you know, and so all I have to do is mm -hmm. look down and see where they are on the uh, the map, what I have marked there, and it, it gives me enough freedom that I can be incredibly flexible with, um, you know, with these types of scenarios. And then usually what I'll have is a, a longer sort of explanation or something for what's in a room, right? I know a lot of uh, DMs sort of like the ultra minimalist. I have this one piece of paper that I use uh, kind of approach. I do that sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's like a lower level adventure or something. But if I've got something complex, if I've got something that I want to make sure I get exactly the way I want it, or that I've thought out ahead of time, then I'll create a key for the map. And mm -hmm. it's pretty, 
I know it's pretty much like what it says on the tin. There's a map, there are numbers in the different locations on it, and then a list of the corresponding numbers with what is actually in there. It might have descriptive text that I read aloud. It might have, um, you know, some sort of unique feature or something. Whatever I need is listed in that key. And I'm probably going to break down that keyed information uh, in sections that are like, this is thing, you know, this is information that the players might know when they walk in. So descriptive text or just a bullet pointed list of what they can see. And then there's going to be a, a section of text, things maybe? that are, what's that? <laughs> a little box text, maybe? A little, maybe. Uh, <laughs> if uh, uh, Inspirational text, uh, we'll call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, a secrets section, right? Like what's here that they don't yeah, know yeah. about that they could discover? Um, you know, who's here in the room? What are they doing? What do they want? That's if there's anyone in there, anybody doing anything, that's going to come first. And yeah, yeah. like having all that at hand and having as much of it as you can fit into one space as possible, like behind your GM screen, basically, the easier it is, it's going to be to run these places. Um, and your key is really like your cheat sheet for this place. Ideally, it has everything on it that you need, monster stats, um, you know, spell effects, whatever, so that you don't have to look up a bunch of books, things like that, while you're running the place. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so our DMs out there, we now have our, our idea of what we want. We got a map of it. But when you're, when you're looking at that, you have to, you have to start uh, deciding uh, like just how big this place is because we've we've discussed things like uh, having a ball at maybe a smaller location to ha having mm -hmm. a dungeon which is yeah. going to be a big sprawling affair and as the players move around you're going to have to worry about that like mm -hmm. as far as scale and movement so uh, what, what yeah. are your considerations when it comes to uh, uh, moving uh, your PCs around this place yeah <laughs> so Movement is important. I'll say that here. And the time it takes to move between locations, how far those locations are. If it weren't important, you would not be writing it up or preparing it as a location, right? You'd be doing something else entirely with it. Um, and, and so being able to tell a player, like, it takes this long to get between these two points is is basic information that will help them decide what they want to do you're probably already doing this most combats that take place on a battle map this is exactly what it is i can move this many squares or this many feet uh when it's my turn here's where that is here's how i get there you know and so really what we're talking about here is movement that takes place like off the battle map Although maybe not, maybe the location is small enough and the positioning is important enough that you're using a battle map sort of out of combat for that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I, like, I don't think it's any, I don't think it does anybody good to be vague or inexact about it. Um, and, and I'll give you a specific example in our Razzle Sin game that is on WebDM plays, like one of the first actual plays we ever put out there where we're playing like at our table where our home group played for years. Uh, there's a moment where the party splits up and uh, Emma's character, the Paladin Fabian, sticks around at an NPC's house to kind of keep guard and whatever. The rest of the party goes off to look for another clue or something like that. I forget exactly. And during this... Um, during this time, right, during this moment, the enemy attacks. And mm -hmm. there's this moment, and I'm pretty sure you can see it on the video, where I've said something like, okay, you guys are like a quarter mile away from, from the paladin, um, but it's the paladin that's being attacked. There's teleporting demons and, and the like that are running through this place. So we're dealing with like a lot of ranges. We're, we're starting to deal with feet in the hundreds and thousands uh, ranges mm -hmm. here. And the realization that like by the time the rest of the party gets back from where they are, quarter mile of away or whatever, the combat will be over. So them sort of rushing back to assist is not really ever going to happen. And so you'll notice that like I get really fuzzy with the distances there as the, the party is trying to run back to where uh, Fabian the Paladin is. While Fabian the Paladin is dealing with an invisible enemy they can't really manage, you know, mm -hmm. and realizing that like, yeah, if this if we're going to make the group go through 
you know, the entire time this would take, it's going to be really unengaging and boring as this one paladin who can't see the enemy just gets messed with and everybody else just goes, I run back, I run back, I run back for 20 however many rounds, you know, of combat. Yeah. And so, you know, had I been running that a bit less off the cuff, I would have been able to tell exactly like, this is how far you've gone in this time. Right. This is how far it's going to take you. Or this is how long it's going to take you to get back where you were uh, kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just for uh, the fans out there, if you want to check out Razzle Sin, that's actually on the our main WebDM channel, not on oh, WebDM okay. Plays. Yeah. But uh, it was it was prior to WebDM Plays. But oh, yeah. We yeah, that's playing. true. Yeah. Very, um, very true. Thank you. Uh, but yes, I do remember that. And I was sad because even though I had Dimension Door, <laughs> that still couldn't help. Um, cause it was just yeah, too I think far that was away. the other one. It was just too far away. It's only yeah. 500 feet. Come on. <laughs> what are you doing yeah. over here? But it's, I can cast feet. it twice. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. That's half the distance. Yeah. yeah. So, like, <laughs> you can express this in terms of actual feet. You can express, express this in, like, actions used. Um, you know, you can express it instead of, um, you know, spatial uh measurement you can do it in time right it's going to take you 10 minutes to get here five minutes or something like that mm -hmm. so there's a lot of different ways you can um, convey that information the entire point of it though is to be able to tell a player it's going to take this long or cost you this much to move between these points so that then they mm -hmm. can decide right one of the fun parts of a location-based scenario is managing the fact that you can't be in all places at all times and you do mm -hmm. have to like make a choice about say which direction you're going to go to approach this particular area or deal with a particular problem you know do you split up or not if you do how do you stay in communication with each other it's easy to hand wave these things away and say oh you know you're the next haul over or you know just let the metagame chatter uh you know go unattended to in the game fiction and just assumed that the party is all in somehow some kind of weird telepathic link with each other for yeah. you know why, why? <laughs> uh but if you're going for something that's a bit more immersive and you're going for something that has a sense of of realness to it a sense of it being a place that you're exploring then answering the questions of like no this is how far apart you are this is how long it takes to get between places this is where you're at in this space like you're really mm -hmm. on the threshold of being able to actually explore another location right like if you've got the map you've got the information on it you can tell the players like this is how you move about this place this is what it costs you this is the time that it takes you're really on the verge of like this is an actual place you're actually exploring right you mm -hmm. might not be physically there you might not be trugging tr you know trundling around the halls and poking your uh, you know your head into doors and things like that but it's as real as you can get for it to be an imaginary place. And at some point when you're looking down at, a, at, <laughs> at your map as a player and going like, I understand this location, like it's real to yeah. me. Uh, that's, that's when you've hit that, uh, that sweet spot. Yeah, I, I remember one of the first times we actually used like uh, miniatures and a real like map that had five foot segments and it was all drawn out it was a long mm. time ago but i just remember the first thing the entire party did was like well i can move this far so i move <laughs> so the monk leaves everybody like and in two rounds of exploring this dungeon we were spread across like a 500 foot area and that's when the uh -huh. dm was like all right here it comes and we like three different groups get attacked and it was just yeah. one of those things where the players got so excited because you can uh -huh. actually see the place. Oh, I can yeah. move that far. Well, I, I'm going to go down here and then take a right down this tunnel. And it's like, well, you yeah. your cler your dwarven cleric with a 25 <laughs> foot way move back there. can't keep up with you, monk. So he's three <laughs> rounds of moving back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was just, it was delightfully chaotic, and it was ultimately a catastrophe. But Certainly, I still remember yeah. it. 
it stood yeah, it no, stands I, out. I do too. I, I remember that too. It was a Hero Quest board, uh, I believe is yep. what we we're using. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, I, I think you know, it, it's one of those things where a more, a more mature G, uh, GM, uh, I was the GM in this case, um, would say, "Wait a minute, you guys are going all over the place. Are you really going to leave your companions behind?" Um, but in this case, it was like, "Yeah, sure. I, I guess you can. You can move all over this map," you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the, these eventually make a difference, and it can be done entirely in theater of the mind. You know, you don't need an actual map that your players are looking at, but you can always say if you're on a VTT, throw up a battle map, something like that, a, a layout of the place. Um, you know, same thing with the home game. If you still have those when you're watching this, uh, <laughs> you know, you can have just a piece of paper uh, with something on it, or you can go the full elaborate 3D terrain, fully painted. You got the lighting and the fog and all that, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it works for uh, any of those uh, any of those uh, points of the spectrum. Most definitely. Um, so. Now that we understand the the scale relation uh, of the place and what it's for, and we got our map mm. of it, it now comes down to the players moving about this location and actually exploring or interacting with it. So, you I mean, I, I hate to try to pad the runtime with filler, but you're going to need <laughs> contents and filler, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, either pre-generated or uh, or on the fly, you know. Um, a place is no good if there's nothing interesting there to see, right? It's not worth mm -hmm. going through all the trouble to, f to figure out the layout, how long it takes, where they are, without there being something really interesting to go through all this trouble for. Otherwise, you would just have it as a single scene. Right. You would just yeah. go to this place as a single scene. It doesn't matter anything. It's, you know, to give it a quick description and then you're there and gone. Right. But going through this much trouble must be for something. It must be in service to something. And that's the content. Right. Um, you can have a, you know, just an extreme level of detail in terms of the content that you're uh, that you're providing. You can know exactly who and what and when and where and why is taking place. You can have just as much description as you want, as you find useful. Um, but I find that it's it's good to have a mix of content in, in terms of its level of detail, that there's some rooms, some places, uh, some features of a location that you really want detailed. Like, I don't want to have to worry about any of this during play. I'm going to write it all down beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. And then others, it's like, I, I, I just need this to like spur my creativity. I don't need to know a lot, you know, and sort of like in the descriptions video, whenever we were talking about uh, having sort of stock locations and descriptions that you give a, a creepy graveyard, a bustling tavern, things like that, and letting the player's imaginations do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. You can do the same here, right? You can say like, it's an office building, like we've been talking about, you know, you kind of know what's there. You kind of know what's going to be in an individual desk or something or what a conference room in one of these places look like looks like. So you already know what's in it, you know, um, and, and and that's sort of one end where you just say it's generic fantasy tavern. It's generic fantasy goblin cave. It's generic sci fi, uh, you know, space bar or something. Uh, and then let that be it, you know, and then you wing it or, or, you know, pull something off the top of your head, uh, during play. Um, but I find having a sufficient number, uh, you know, enough for a good night's evening of gaming, right. Um, of, of like really detailed and evocative places or features or things that are in these locations, you know, really give the player something to spend time with and, uh, poke around one of the things to consider when you're talking about level of detail or exactness in your descriptions and features that you put in a location is to think about how they reinforce or or highlight the purpose of this place right so going back to the beginning of the top of the show what kind of scenario are you running that you need this location for is it a, in a character in and of itself or is it an extension of another character 
So when you're thinking about these things and, and these are features of the location, you can both like lean into the expected, right? If it's a dragon's lair that we're talking about here, uh, you know, the treasure room, the treasure hoard is going to be something that's very much expected of a dragon's lair. You know, there's d lots of different ways you can do it. It can be the big piles of treasure. It can be like well sorted and <laughs> accounted for and the like. But it's it's expected, you know. It's expected when you go into to a fantasy tavern that there's going to be a big tap room and, and, and the like, and maybe something that approaches like some private rooms or, or booths or something you could go to. Um, yeah, champagne. So there should be a... Exactly, right. <laughs> there, having those predictable locations, like, takes some of the burden off you in terms of, like, just coming up with stuff for your imagination, but it also makes it more predictable for the players. But you want to make sure that there is enough that's not predictable, that is a little bit uh, off of, about a place, that makes it interesting, right? Something about it that, that isn't obvious, but that when you think about it, what's included in this place, it seems to fit. You know, so if we're talking about, say, a dragon's lair, that might be a, a visitor's room. You know, a place where non-dragon sized visitors to the dragon might be able to come and converse with it in some way, whether that's, uh, you know, poking its head through a large opening or polymorphing into, you know, a creature that's close to their visitor's size or something like that. It makes sense once you think about it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I guess that dragon would have that there, given the world that we're in. But when you think about Dragon's mm -hmm. Lair, it's not something that you immediately think of, right? Yes. Come to my parlor. <laughs> right, yes. yeah, come to my parlor. <laughs> you know, for a tavern, it might be something like, you know, you, you, you know, you expect there to be a common room or a tap room or something like that. But then there's also a casino, uh, you know, next yeah. door to it where it's like, it makes sense, but you wouldn't think immediately like, oh, yeah, the tavern, there must be a casino, you know, in there somewhere, you know, or you make it a secret gambling den down in the basement. Yeah. And so, yep. obviously, rats have infiltrated, so that's your first level. Go down and get rid of the rats. That's a secret gambling deal. Right. Yeah. They're having their own uh, their own party. They've taken over the tables. Mm -hmm. You just can't go in there anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, and so, yeah, like, like that's, that's the kind of stuff you want to stuff into your uh, location. Those are the kinds of things that you want in there. But, like, it's also a big tax on your imagination, yeah? Uh, well, it, it can be. Uh, so that's, I, I think um, y you know, there are ways to uh, to buffer against that 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 mm -hmm. burnout, mm -hmm. that brain burnout that you can get. You, you can have some lists. <laughs> lists yeah. are amazing. I think we yes. did discuss that over in the de the description show. So uh -huh. uh, you know, you can see how the Venn diagram of the D and D or DM basic shows. <laughs> <laughs> begin to, to overlap a DM yeah. Here. yeah 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 i love lists of words right yeah. like one of the one of the more useful tools that i've found recently for running a location or, or really just any kind of of scene uh, in an rpg is a list of adjectives you know just just evocative words just like chew through a thesaurus and pick out the best ones you can find, the most baroque, the most interesting, the ones that you you know you didn't realize the, you know this was even a word, just something yeah. to give you a a wide palette to uh, to choose from whenever you're describing a place. Um, it it can be I don't know, let me see the good way to put it. I, I was surprised at how effective just this little thing could be 10 to 12, maybe 20 or so words uh, at most, because, you know, a lot of the ways that I run locations are to have like the mechanical parts of a location really nailed down. Like I don't want to have to think mm -hmm. these things up in play. I want to be able to just reference it and go, but the descriptions are usually kept sort of vague and very broad strokes, you know? And so being able to have like a list of, descriptors for a place that that I know I'm going to spend some time in but I don't necessarily want to do like a whole bunch of pregame prep for is a lifesaver 
and and just being able to have some variety and and uh and to think of uh things outside of that moment write them down and include them make sure i don't forget them that kind of thing so list of descriptors of adjectives things like that are, are top of my list for lists to have it when i'm running <laughs> so so you have your list of what of lists you need and on I have that a list, list of lists uh-huh list of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's multiple Tonight lists. we're adventuring for the list of lists uh, right. <laughs> and it's a joust so you'll have to do it in the list anyway um yeah yeah <laughs> Um, go loop back a bit to procedural generation and, and spend some time talking about that. Cause it's one thing to have like the random encounter table or a wandering monsters table or something. Right. But the point of procedural generation, particularly in play is to give you more than just one thing. It's to create a game element, a scenario, a, a, a feature, whatever, um, that is ready for gaming you don't have to do anything else with it you just plop it down and that's why like a wandering monster table is only half of what you need what are they doing mm -hmm. where did you find them you know what do they want those kinds of things are going to be as important as what is it that's there in the first place and so when you start thinking of things like lists and and what you want to include looking and seeing like where the overlap between just having a list of stuff that you might need and a procedural generator can come in handy. One of those is uh, a type of feature for locations that I really love, I think might get a bad rap in some gaming circles, but I find very important, and that is empty rooms. And an empty room, which yeah, I, I, mean, I think sort of, an empty room is sometimes maligned as being, you know, unnecessary for an adventure. You know, an empty room is, you know, there's nothing there. It's a speed bump. You know, you just pass right through it. Get, get to the good stuff, you know. And it's, it's a part of a style of play that's very much like rush through the boring parts. Don't dwell on the things that, that aren't immediately engaging. You know, I understand where that style of game comes from, but, but it throws a lot, a lot of babies out with its bathwater, right? <laughs> like the fact mm -hmm. that you have an empty room, something where there, is in, where there isn't anything, uh, it's there because you might want to pace your adventure. It's there because you might want to give the PCs a, a lo part of this location to claim as their own. Maybe they need a place to mm -hmm. rest. Maybe they need a place to regroup or to plan. Uh, an empty room doesn't have to be a featureless room, right? When we mean empty, we mean empty of inhabitants, right? There could be all manner of, of, of features, traps, tricks, puzzles, and the like that go into it. Mm -hmm. For the most part, Secret though, doors. the more in I mean, secret doors. Yeah. Oh God. Yes. Right. Hidden treasure, things like that. Uh, for the most part, if it's really involved, if it's like a super involved puzzle or trick or trap or something, then that is its own monster in a, in a sense. Um, but it could have just weird stuff, right? Like an empty room is the place to put uh, a magical feature that has no discernible benefit or harm. And you might not ever even be able to figure out how it works. It's just kind of there, right? a fountain whose water sort of like flows upwards into the ceiling or something like that, or a, you know, a giant chess game with animated pieces or something, you know, it's there for the players to look at, interact if they want. But the real point of this place is to give the players uh, a part of the map that is their own. You know, and even if you're not running a classic mega dungeon style where you're going to be revisiting the same location over and over and over, exploring its, its maze-like corridors, your players can still find a use for an empty room. They can still mm -hmm. find a, a, a reason to turn that place into something that their characters, <laughs> you know, have, have claimed, right? This is, our, this is our, uh, our home base. This is where we're going to fall back to if the opposition, opposition gets to be too much. This is where we're going to change out of our various disguises uh, or mm -hmm. whatever, or where we're going to, like, stash our loot whenever uh, we're done. Um, or the bodies. You know, or, or the bodies, <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Think of, to come back to Die Hard, right? How much of the yeah. Die Hard movie is just him walking through empty rooms, 
right? Yeah, just I mean, there's a there's a, there's a whole part where he's walking through an empty place because it's not being finished constru- uh, being constructed yet. But mm-hmm. yeah, I take I mean I take your point. There's a lot of places in there where it's just uh, you know a picture on the wall that you want to kiss when you go by or uh, yeah or, or whatever or pull glass yeah, out yeah. of your foot. <laughs> right, exactly. I, I bring it up here because, you know, we, earlier we talked about all the interesting things you can put in a location, all of the features and room types and whatever that are there. And at some point it can start to feel like a location is overstuffed, that there's too much going on. It's it's too, you know, implausible or, or breaks our su- su- suspension of disbelief for like all of this stuff to be right next to each other, you know. Mm-hmm. So including empty space gives gives a bit of buffer it gives a sense of 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 separation to the various elements that you're putting in a location perhaps it it, it creates a degree of plausibility that you could have a giant fight in one room and the monsters in the next room don't come to investigate unless that's what you want in which case put them right next to each other you know Mm -hmm. um but an empty room creates pacing it creates tension uh, you know, if the first room of a dungeon that you go in is a, just a nasty guardian type monster or encounter, just like a real knockdown drag out fight, uh, for, for PCs that have their full resources at their disposal. And then after that, there's just a series of empty echoing halls might put your players on edge. Like when is the next one of these going to hit? Like, mm-hmm. where is everyone else in this place? You could do the reversal, like, you know, you thought that this location was, you know, bustling and, and, and that there would be enemies, you know, <laughs> wall to wall, but there's nothing, you know, it, it seems empty. And so you start letting your guard down after the, you know, third or fourth room that you go through, there's, you know, nothing in it that seems hostile. Then they might not be as careful when you finally get to a room that has something in it, or you realize that the enemy is following behind you through those empty rooms, is is running parallel mm-hmm. to you, or tracking your movement. Those are the kinds of things that you can do. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I find that the empty room principle, which is that these aren't just spaces where there's no adventure to be had or or things to skip past, but like thinking of why you would include them uh, and what purpose they could Mm -hmm. serve again like highlights location brings it to life and creates a fun adventure environment because there is a place to take a break (laughs) there is a place to be Mm -hmm. like enough we're going to hold up here for a while you know nail the door shut be ultra quiet and take our short rest (laughs) yeah because that's when you find out it's all about the contents you brought along the way yeah (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.